What happens when you take a woman from Victorian era England and place her in the middle of rural Meiji era Japan? The answer lies in Isabella Berg's Unbeaten Tracks in Northern Japan, a travelogue of a journey she took from June to September 1878. I first took an interest in Isabella's story when I was living in Japan as an English teacher. I lived in Shinjo City, just next to the village of Kaneyama, where there's a park named in Isabella's honor. I was interested to hear what she thought of Shinjo, and boy was I in for a shock, but more on that later. Today, we'll explore her journey through the northern part of Japan's main island. We'll look at the trip conditions, her impressions, and the hilarious love-hate relationship between her and her interpreter Ito. In an era before a woman could vote, 47-year-old Isabella Lucy Bird was a trailblazer. She traveled alone to the United States, Hawaii, and Japan, and later to China, India, and across the Middle East. As a woman from England living at the height of the British Empire, Isabella sometimes displays attitudes that today we would consider troubling, prejudiced, or even racist. I'll try to give some historical context to these episodes without trying to justify her prejudices. Given her worldview, we might ask ourselves, why did she even go to other countries? It turns out, Isabella was a very adventurous woman, and was curious about how people lived in other cultures. Over time, we'll see her become more accustomed to Japanese culture and a bit more open-minded. After she arrived in Tokyo, Isabella started looking for a Japanese interpreter to guide her throughout her journey. She eventually found Ito, a young Japanese man who had taught himself English by working with foreigners traveling through Japan. This was the beginning of the Meiji era, a time when Japan was rapidly industrializing and trying to avoid becoming another country's colony. That meant significant political, economic, and social changes for Japan. Isabella witnessed a snapshot of a changing country that today is in many ways unrecognizable from what she saw. But after arriving in Tokyo, she could sense this change and wrote in her own words a phrase which is just as true today as 140 years ago. The old and the new in this great city contrast with and jostle each other. But she didn't spend most of her time in Tokyo. Isabella traveled through northern Japan, a region we now call Tohoku, which at the time was very underdeveloped and difficult to access. As Isabella described it, Only strong people should travel in northern Japan. Her journey was over unbeaten tracks, traveling by horse and sometimes on foot. They traversed steep mountains and had to ford rivers. Sometimes they also rode boats, which were a bit faster. This grueling journey would take her just 10 or 20 miles a day, and 10 or so hours of traveling. The worst part is that there was little information available about what path to take to go from one destination to the next. In northern Japan, in the absence of all other sources of information, I had to learn everything from the people themselves through an interpreter. Speaking of her interpreter Ito, Isabella had a fun fact that she loved to share with people everywhere she went. I told Ito to tell them that a Japanese horse galloping night and day without ceasing would take five and a half weeks to reach my country, a statement which he is using lavishly as I go along. As she embarked on her journey, she already started to see a shift in the surroundings as she approached the outskirts of Tokyo. Must I write it? The houses were mean, poor, shabby, often even squalid, the smells were bad, and the people looked ugly, shabby, and poor. Next, she goes to Nikko, an ancient and beautiful city with grand temples and shrines. They take one prisoner by their beauty in defiance of all rules of Western art and compel one to acknowledge the beauty of forms and combinations of color hitherto unknown and that lacquered wood is capable of lending itself to the expression of a very high idea in art. I'm beginning to appreciate the extreme beauty of solitude in decoration. In the alcove hangs a kakamono of exquisite beauty, a single blossoming branch of the cherry. After Nico, she continues north into the countryside, staying in different villages along the way. Mountains and passes, valleys and rice swamps, Forests and rice swamps, villages and rice swamps, poverty, industry, dirt, ruinous temples, prostrate Buddhas, strings of straw shod pack horses, long, grey, featureless streets, and quiet, staring crowds all jumbled up fantastically in my memory. Once she left Tokyo, she founded Japan where the music, architecture, fashion, and food had barely changed since the Edo era. The Edo period, 
which had just ended 10 years before her trip, was a period when Japan was almost isolated from the outside world for over 250 years. She stayed at traditional Japanese inns, which were called yadoya, which today we would call ryokan. The conditions of her accommodations varied from place to place. Some were sumptuous, like the inns that used to serve the feudal lords known as daimyo. Other places were dirty, smoky, and bug-infested. Often they had fleas in the tatami mats on the floor. Isabella and Ito were really roughing it, sometimes dealing with wet clothes and even one time a damp bed in an inn. Did I mention bugs? Beetles, spiders, and wood lice held a carnival in my room after dark, and the presence of horses in the same house brought a number of horse flies. At this point in history, Japan was just starting to develop. The interior was incredibly impoverished, as we can hear from Isabella's eyewitness account. It is painful to see the prevalence of such repulsive maladies as scabies, scald head, ringworm, sore eyes, and unwholesome looking eruptions, and fully 30% of the village people are badly seamed with smallpox. The Japanese government later invested a lot in these areas, and today the standard of living is much higher. Certainly these kinds of diseases are unheard of now. Isabella didn't have much privacy on her trip. Of course, the notion of privacy can vary from one culture to another. Still, on multiple occasions, she saw people peering into her room from holes in the shoji paper doors. The shoji were full of holes, and often at each hole I saw a human eye. The Japanese people in these regions had rarely seen a foreigner, and certainly not a foreign woman. Isabella often attracted crowds as she went along. In these little travel districts, as soon as one reaches the margin of a town, the first man who meets turns and flies down the street, calling out the Japanese equivalent of, here's a foreigner, and soon blind and seeing, old and young, clothed and naked, gathered together. But she noted that they were always polite. She remarked that the same courtesy wouldn't be granted in other countries. In many European countries, and certainly in some parts of our own, a solitary lady traveller in a foreign dress would be exposed to rudeness, insult and extortion, if not to actual danger. But I have not met with a single instance of incivility or real overcharge, and there is no rudeness even about the crowding. Isabella had a bit of culture shock when it came to Japanese food. Of course, this was before dishes like sushi became a worldwide phenomenon. Given how vastly different traditional English and Japanese cuisines are, perhaps it's no surprise that she had trouble adapting. Shirley used to black teas like English breakfast and Earl Grey. Isabella noted the differences with Japanese teas. If Japanese tea stands, it acquires a coarse bitterness and an unwholesome astringency. Milk and sugar are not used. She often complained about the food. No food can be got here except rice and eggs. I found nothing that I could eat except black beans and boiled cucumbers. In order to understand my feelings, you must have experienced what it is not to have tasted fish, flesh or fowl for 10 days. She had especially strong feelings about tofu. A wretched meal of a tasteless white curd made from beans. And sometimes the culture shock went the other way. The idea of anything but a calf milking a cow was so new to the people that there was a universal laugh, and Ito told me that they thought it most disgusting. Still, let's focus on Isabella's impressions of Japan and her culture shock. If you've ever been to Japan in the summer, you'll know that it's hot and muggy, Isabella was shocked that people walked around in little or no clothing. I'll note that nowadays, everyone is clothed, but the weather is just as unbearable. Isabella had a disturbing obsession with people's facial features. She believed that these genetic traits correlated to people's intelligence and social class. This follows the then popular, but now discredited pseudoscience of eugenics, which was eventually adopted by Nazi Germany's ideology. While Isabella couldn't have foreseen where these ideas would lead, with hindsight, we have to understand how dangerous these ideas would become. Isabella was also hyper-focused on cultural differences regarding appearance. The custom in Japan at the time was for married women to shave off their eyebrows and blacken their teeth. Coming from Victorian England, where makeup was seen as something for a woman with poor morals, Isabella hated the traditional makeup that Japanese women sometimes wore. The habit of painting the lips with a reddish-yellow pigment, and of heavily powdering the face and throat with pearl powder, is a repulsive one. 
She even refers to a bride and her white face makeup as profusely disfigured. She also thought that Japanese people looked unattractive in Western clothing. So how should we judge the attitudes of a Victorian woman from 1878? I think we can criticize her when she was wrong. But we also have to understand the historical context. I don't know, what do you think? I'm trying to strike a balance here. Okay, if you hate her a little bit right now, rest assured she had some difficult times. For at least the second time, she tumbled off a horse. I found myself being hauled out of a ditch by three men and realized that the horse had tumbled down in going down a steepish hill and that I had gone over his head. Isabella went to a tea house and was surprised that the owner had never heard of England. Having spied a solitary house on the very brow of a hill, 15,000 feet higher, I dragged out the information that it was a tea house and came up to it. This house is magnificently situated, almost hanging over the edge of a knife-like ridge of the pass of Karuma on which it is situated. At the housemistress's request, I wrote a eulogistic description of the view from her house and read it in English, Ito translating it to the very great satisfaction of the assemblage. Then I was asked to write on four fans. The woman has never heard of England. She knows of Russia as a great power and of course of China, but there her knowledge ends, though she has been at Tokyo and Kyoto. I just imagine her being like, you know, England, like we own half the world and being so frustrated that this lady has never heard of it. <laughs> Next, she rode a boat down a river until she got to Niigata city. She gives us a lovely description of the townhouses. The fronts are very narrow and the houses extend backwards to an amazing length with gardens in which flowers, shrubs and mosquitoes are grown and bridges are several times repeated so as to give the effect of fairyland as you look through from the street. And where did she go next? Well, it's funny you should ask. The map is blank in this region. At almost every step along the way, she would ask for directions for the next town or village, and people wouldn't give a straight answer. Eventually, she would find a path by comparing different maps, if they were available. Her interpreter Ito was a great help to her throughout the journey, but they weren't too fond of each other. Here are a few things she said about him. He has a large share of personal vanity, whitens his teeth and powders his face carefully before a mirror, and is in great dread of sunburn. He speaks English already far better than many professional interpreters, but would be more pleasing if he had not picked up some American vulgarisms and free and easy ways. Which is such a backhanded compliment. By the way, like and subscribe for more American vulgarisms and free and easy ways. Anyway, now we get to the good stuff. So remember that town I mentioned, Shinjo, where I lived? Well, this is her impression of it. After a long ascent through a region of light, peaty soil, wooded with pine, cryptomeria, and scrub oak, a long descent, a fine avenue terminate in Shinjo, a wretched town of a wretched town of over five thousand people, situated in a plain of rice fields. Again, I write that Shinjo is a wretched place. Damn, she had to say it twice. I guess I can see why they don't talk about her much in Shinjo. Still, let's remember this was a snapshot of Japan at a changing time. She gives a little more context for her impression. Shinjo is a daimyo's town, and every daimyo's town that I have seen has an air of decay, partly owing to the fact that the castle is either pulled down or has been allowed to fall into decay. Shinjo has a large trade in rice, silk, and hemp, and ought not to be as poor as it looks. Okay, I know I'm 140 years too late, but I need to do some damage control. Let me just interject to say that Shinjo is a lovely place. Please visit in late August for their annual Festival of Floats, which is recognized by UNESCO as intangible world heritage. And the meal options have definitely improved since 140 years ago. My wretched meal of sago and condensed milk. There was a hot rain all night. My wretched room was dirty and stifling, and rats gnawed my boots and ran away with my cucumbers. I promise your boots and cucumbers will be safe too. Anyway, next she went to the neighboring village of Kaneyama, which is surrounded by mountains. At their feet lies Kaneyama in a romantic situation. Okay, I can see why there's a statue of her there. Kaneyama is also lovely. Please check it out. So back to her journey. Isabella had the first of several near-death experiences while on a riverboat. 
I had long been watching a large houseboat far above us on the other side. The stream overpowered the crew and in no time she swung round and came drifting wildly down and across the river, broadside onto us. For a moment it was a question whether she would not smash us to atoms. Anyway, as her trip went on, we do see some positive changes in her impression of Japanese culture. It is interesting to see watering places with their habits, amusements and civilization quite complete, but borrowing nothing from Europe. Isabella writes that she has become quite used to Japanese life. She slowly starts to appreciate Japanese food and the beauty of the countryside. And Ito, her interpreter, has some low-key sass that has obviously irked her enough to write about it. If he wishes to tell me that he has seen a very tipsy man, he always says he has seen a fellow as drunk as an Englishman. And finally, while recovering from fatigue and severe insect bites, she notes that Ito shows his sympathy for me by intense surliness. Over three months, Isabella and Ito hiked from Tokyo to Aomori. They traveled by horseback, going over mountains and more mountains, from one village to another. Finally, they get on a ship to go to her next destination, the island of Hokkaido, which was then known as Yezo, or Ezochi. Her travelogue summarizes an arduous journey and provides a fascinating portrait of a Japan that no longer exists, or at least how it appeared to her English eyes. If you're interested in reading her book for yourself, don't! It's long and boring, with each day melting into the next. She even says that the book might be monotonous, as its primary purpose is to record the trip. That's why I've painstakingly gone through it, so you don't have to. In my next video, we'll learn about her time among the indigenous Ainu people and her three-week trek through the Hokkaido wilderness. Get ready for some more hilarious antics with Ito, more near-death experiences, and some problematic amateur anthropology. Subscribe to hear more about the good, the bad, and the ugly of cross-cultural relations throughout history. Thanks for watching. See you again soon.